the limitations, the restrictions. Uh, and what's amazing to me is the way she made the transition from there to America, which is endless open spaces. You know, not just a different world, a different planet in many respects. Now she's going from the known to the known, and so far she's going to her relatives or going to family and going to faces that you're familiar with in certain respects and all the rest of it. Nevertheless, there's a huge history there as to how you trace people who come from one very particular, limited, confined space and then have to expand into the vastness of America, even though she's very local in America at one level because she's going to, from the known to the known at one level. Um, but it's, it's an amazing story. She was obviously a remarkable woman, a remarkable woman in so many ways. Uh, and uh, I'm not going to linger over that here, except to say that for the historical profession in general, I think it's a work, and I hear I totally agree with Miriam, that transcends the, the specifics, the very minutiae of Terry life and of, of, of that, because um, she, she has to incorporate many existences in her own existence, uh, but also the way he puts the questions. Uh, God knows how many... It was an interrogation your mother in, 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 in many respects. I'm sure she thought it was an interrogation at times. Um, and um, uh, it, it's, one, it's I think the most remarkable mother-son sort of exchanges that I have, or, or commentaries that I have ever come across. And I think it, I would make it required reading for all historians, in, as Miriam was saying, in terms of trying to grasp what we're about and how a huge amount of what we put down in professional academic history is in fact only... It's only getting a minor section of what the historic, historical experience of humanity has been. Uh, it's crucial, it's, un it's inescapable, it's invaluable, but it still does only, in many respects, only either touch the surface or only where it digs deeper, it digs deeper into a very narrow segment of the historical experience. It's not going to shut up or it's going all night, so this will go on there. And anyway, thank you so much for coming. And <laughs> We're going to just, uh, we're going to loosely do this as a Q&A. You're not here to hear me, obviously, but I'm going to prompt Richard maybe in some questions. But could we just, out of interest, so we have an idea, have a show of hands, how many people in the room have actually read Remembering Hanagran, just so we know? Oh, wow. More than you thought, right? Um, so maybe... Maybe just do a quick kind of background to the book uh, a bit, Richard, maybe not as much as we thought, given so many people have actually read it, and uh, we'll just take it from there. Sure, it's, um, it's interesting Joe re-read it yesterday, because I re-read it yesterday. <laughs> 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 I was at um, my cousin's in New Jersey. And, oh, sorry, is this on? Yeah, yeah. 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 So I was at my cousin Gerard's in um, New Jersey, and luckily he had a copy, because I forgot my copy. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I sat and read it, and that's the first time I've read the whole thing through, I think, in almost 20 years. Too. Uh, but the book itself had an origins in Christmas in Seattle. I published a book which won a lot of awards called The Middle Ground, and I gave my mother. My mother collected my books. She didn't read my books. <laughs> <laughs> My brother's a mystery novelist, and as my mother once explained to my son, when he said that I wrote books too, he said, no, your Uncle Stephen writes real books. People read them. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I gave her the book, and she did start to read it. She read about 10 or 15 pages, and she said, I'm more interesting than this. Why don't you write a book about me? And that was the beginning of the book. We made a deal. And it's a deal I think she came to regret. And this is hard for me to talk because I have people on both sides here. But um, it's a deal she came to regret. I said, what I will do is you've been telling me stories. And I actually recorded stories before I ever started the book for the family. I will take your stories, but I'm going to treat them the way I would treat any other source as a historian. I'm going to find out what I can about them. I'm going to put them in context. I'm going to get other records. And um, I'll be the historian, and we will put your stories that way. So it's not that your stories are going to stand, but she has perfect confidence in her stories. And so that didn't seem like much of a challenge at all. And that's how the book began. It began a collaboration, which took two or three years. And it was, it was a difficult collaboration. It would be times where I remember I would come up with documents and... Um, my read them to my mother, and there'd be silence at the end of the phone. And then I can't, again, I can't totally recreate her voice, her tone. But after the silence, she said, how many interesting things I'm finding out about myself. Um, <laughs> and what happened as we went on is there's nothing my mother told me 
that was not true in the sense that it had not happened. And there's nothing that happened in precisely the way she said it. What she had done, and this becomes the theme of the book, it's about um, how she takes her memories and weaves them into a story, which is an account of her life. And, and the basic thing I do in the book is that her memory, and memory in general, acts to make sense of who you are. It's a living thing. And for her, her memories, her stories will always change because she's changed. As she has to explain who she is in a new context, she'll change the story. She'll add things, things will drop out. And for me, as a historian, I work with dead things. I mean, the only things that historians respect are things that should not be changed, the things you find in an archive, the things that you will bring to bear um, on the kind of history that you write. And what I found as we went on is that it wasn't so much that history and memory were war with each other, but they certainly stalked each other. They certainly stalked each other very warily. And as the book, the most difficult part of the book was when my mother began to doubt her own memories, her own stories. There's a time where I realized this, not only was it a cruel book, but how cruel the work I do is. We came to a resolution about but in the end, when she would say, my mother would do things, I told the story this afternoon, she'd have two cousins, and both of them are near you, Wells. Um, and both of them get into trouble, Irish mafia, she called them. And um, one of them had descendants, and one of them didn't. And one of them was worse than the other, and the one that was the worst had the descendants. So my mother suggested that I change their names around. Um, she didn't want to offend anybody with descendants, so why don't we say that this person did it, and this other person didn't do it, even though it's, it's not true. And I said, Mom, I can't do that. I'm a, I'm a historian. That's not, that's not how we work. So she was willing to change all kinds of things in service of the present. And I write in service of the present, but it's a very different present. And at one point, I, I told her, look, and the book itself, as I'll say in a, in a moment, had a mixed reception in my family. Um, and when she was upset about it and wondered about why we had to put these things in and we had reached a deal about it, um, I said, look, if I cannot do this to my own family, what authority do I have to do it to anybody's family? If I'm not willing to apply these standards to my own family, and I gave her a choice at the end, and it really was up in the air. I said, you can point out anything that I did in here that's false or wrong, and I will change it. And any time you think I'm telling a story gratuitously, there's no point to the wider account, but it's just in there to titillate, I will take it out. But I won't take out anything that's critical to the story, and I won't change things that I think are true. And you have a decision to make, and your decision is, if you want, I will destroy the manuscript. Not just not publish it, I will burn the manuscript. Um, but if you take it as it is, with the, all the corrections that you might suggest, then that stands. And I didn't hear for for two weeks. Um, so it really was a hard decision. And when the book came out, um, there are relatives who don't speak to me today. Um, my Uncle Bert, because on the Jewish side of the family, my grandfather went to prison. And my Uncle Bert didn't even know I knew that, though I did know it. He certainly didn't have all the accounts. And at one point, he called my brother Stephen, Stephen who's a, the mystery novelist. And he, and he said to him, Stephen, how do we find this stuff out? Stephen said, Bert, he's a historian. That's what he does. He finds stuff out. Um, and so Bert has not spoken to me since then. Um, as a matter of fact, he sent back the copy of the book I sent him. And um, my mother's cousin, Thomas Holly, who she was very close to in Ireland, that relationship sort of ended in a shouting match in front of Thomas Holly's house between my mother and Thomas Holly, who was not mad at my mother, he was mad at me. And the, and the problem there is it's something that everybody in um, Ahanagar, everybody in Valley, the village around there knew that Thomas Holly's wife had been a nun and had then come back and gotten married. Everybody knew it, but I proved to them the same thing with Bert about what an idiot I was. What everybody knows is not what you say. This is what you say to family. This is not what you publish to the whole world. And that is the difference, is one of the major differences between how my mother's memories work. Because a lot of the things I had wasn't, wasn't news, but it was who I was telling it to. And 
as I understood at the end, I really learned a lot from the book, but one of the things I understood at the end is on both sides of my family, they're immigrants. And their struggle in the United States was for respectability. And they had attained a kind of respectability. And then I come along. Um, and I talk about things which should not be talked about. I go back to a time where the beginnings are not particularly respectful. And as they saw it, and they were perfectly right, what do I have to lose? Mm -hmm. I'm a university professor, particularly at the end, I'm teaching at Stanford. It makes no difference to me that my grandfather was in prison. I adored my grandfather. All of the things that my mother confronted as an immigrant in Chicago, to me, I find interesting and a valuable part of the world, even though they would like to mask that over. But for them, this is a respectability which I once more have endangered. And so I understood, particularly among the um, relatives of my mother's generation, what I, what I had done. And it's, as I say, it led me to understand what, what cruel work I did. And there's no way to be a historian without engaging in that kind of cruelty. Richard, can I ask you, um, <coughs> At one point when I interviewed you, and I'd love you to share this reflection if you still feel the same, you made some comments about how you are part Jewish and part Irish, you're both and neither, and how the American part fits into that. And it's, I suppose, following on from what you've just said, it's, you know, a lot of time, and this is why the comparative dimension is so rich, a lot of time we we'll say, oh, well, it's about them being Irish or it's about them being Jewish because that's how they behave. Well, you're really talking about a more universal experience in terms of the aspiration of respectability. Could you make some comments on those things? Sure. It, it takes, I think any child who's a child of any kind of mixed marriage, um, you have to learn that there's something strange going on. Um, because for me, <laughs> my father's Jewish and my mother's Irish, and that's the way the world is. But it was not, in the 1940s, um, those kinds of mixed marriages were not easy. They were alienated at the beginning from both families, and then they made contact again with both families. And as I began to recognize that there were tensions there, it also taught me a lot about myself, my own identity, and about an, an American identity, too. Because I was having lunch with an um, old friend today, who I've known for, for years and years and years, and I, and I said I'd been visiting my cousin Gerard, I'd been out in New Jersey, and he said, I didn't know your cousin lived in New Jersey. And I said, sure, I've told you that. And I thought, well, maybe I haven't told him that. Because when, when I'm with Jewish friends, and he's Jewish, I talk about the Jewish side of my family. When I'm with Gerard and Mary, and with Irish family, I talk about the Irish side of my family. Because what I can do is I can move easily back and forth between them. The Irish, and Irish and Jews are really easy to do this way, because in Ireland, as I realized the first time I went back, um, I was a Yank, and everybody who had left there and had stayed in the United States for any time was a Yank. I mean, they weren't Irish. So there was no sense that I had ever pretended I was Irish, but they were all my relations. They took me in. And so it was really easy to be there. Um, and on the Jewish side of the family, I clearly was not Jewish because my mother was Irish Catholic. So I had Jewish relatives, but I wasn't Jewish. And so what I was was this mixture of the two. What I was, is I, I realized, is I, I'm American. That's, that's all I am. Like the Irish got a dead on. I'm a Yank. <laughs> that's, that's what I am. And um, it made me easy to move back and forth between those two worlds because I could understand them. They're my family. Um, I don't have to have another identity with them. They're just my family. Um, and so that's how I negotiate both of these worlds, going back and forth. And I think that's true for a lot of immigrants and a lot of mixed families. Because my family has continued to go on, where my sister is married to um, a Mexican immigrant. And that's, again, it's another kind of negotiation. But here, there's other common grounds that come in. I mean, it's, it's Our Lady of Guadalupe becomes the, the sort of link between <laughs> and, and, and my mother. But also, my brother died a few years ago. And right after that, Ed's father died. And so my brother Stephen and I went to the, um, to the funeral in Los Angeles, where it was, in, it was largely a Mexican-American cemetery. And um, you know, as we watched the family dynamics, they were really familiar to me. People weren't speaking to each other. <laughs> People were fighting. There were, there were grudges so old, nobody could remember what it was. And I walked by my 
brother Stephen exactly, but at the end he went to Ed and he said, he said, you know, I, I really enjoyed this. It's nice to see a family as screwed up as mine. <laughs> <laughs> so, so these kinds of things work work both ways. Can you go back and talk a little bit about when you first thought about that difference in terms of the family dynamic? I think it was around the time you made your first Holy Communion. Yeah, um, these are these are stories that go back back a ways. Because um, I was not until I was six or seven, I was not raised Catholic at all. And then we were in New York, and my mother at that time. I always thought when I was growing up, and my mother had always been religious. I went back to Ireland. And it turned out that was not true. She got more religious as she, as she, after she came to California. But she decided that, you know, I'd been baptized, but she wanted a first communion. And at that time, I didn't see my Irish relatives in Chicago, because they were still alienated there, but my, I saw my Jewish relatives. But it's, you know, it's really hard to have the first communion when your grandmother <laughs> is Jewish and doesn't, and is not really on board with this kind of stuff. And my mother, as I explained in the book, had a really shaky grasp of what Jewish was. She thought it was some exotic form of Protestantism. <laughs> she'd seen Protestants in Ireland, but she'd never grown up. And then later on, this becomes one of the things in the mixed marriage of the Americans, that the, the mayor of Dublin was Jewish. So this becomes we become the only family in Orange County, California, who's sort of this, or intimate with the mayor of Dublin, <laughs> because he's Jewish. And my grandmother comes out, so my mother um, gets us to go to First Communion, but when I go to First Communion, the nuns find out, I don't even know how, probably I told them that my, my father was Jewish. And so, um, what the nun told me, she said, well, he's going to hell. And so I was a little upset. Um, and at this time was a moment in my parents' marriage where sometimes when things went bad with my mother and father, what my father would do, he'd be kicked out of bed, basically. And he'd come into our bedroom and he'd push me aside and um, and sleep there. And so I, I came in, but then he came in and I thought, you know, if he's here, he's going to be in hell. So I started I started crying. And my father was a real sensitive guy. Um, says, what's wrong with you? <laughs> so I told him, I said, the nuns told me you're going to hell. He said, shut up and go to sleep. <laughs> Um, you talk, Richard, about um, a sense that Sarah, your mom, was always in kind of an exile here in the United States. Is that something you still maintain? Well, it's, it's an exile, but again, it's the, it's the way I think any, many immigrant families have this. My mother always wanted to go back to Ireland. She didn't get to go back until 1969. And she'd immigrated in 1936. So I have you know, vivid memories of walking into my mother's bedroom and um, seeing her crying. And my mother was always pretty kind and responsive to us. And she just looked at me and she just told me, get out. Um, and I left and shut the door. And it turned out she just found out that her mother had died. So she, and she knew when she left Ireland. It's one of the things she says in the book. She said, I knew I would never see her again. And she never, she never did see her again. And she never, she saw her father all too much, but she never saw him after he went back because my family's unusual in the sense that my um, grandmother and grandfather both immigrated to the United States and went back to Ireland, but they were not back there together. There was this long separation before they, before they went back. So my mother always had the sense that Ireland became this place, this romantic place, which comes out in the book. And when she goes back in 1969, it's a different Ireland. It's an Ireland that's changing. And she had a wonderful time back there. I mean, every time she went back to Kerry. I mean, it was an occasion that she showed up. You know, she, made, she reconnected with all of her brothers and sisters. And um, she, she was just in heaven. And one of the hard things about getting her back to Ireland is that she had to get a passport in 1969. Um, and it turned out she had not become a citizen. Um, that did not stop her from voting in Chicago and every place else for 23 20, 20 years. So my father thought this was pretty hilarious. <laughs> my mother didn't. My mother was embarrassed. But she finally she finished her citizenship and went back to Ireland. And it, and it became a question. Even then, it's, 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 it's one of the things that my mother had dementia for the last 10 years. And so 
she would sometimes talk about being buried, particularly in the early years, and sometimes she wanted to be in Ireland, and sometimes she wanted to be in Boston next to my father. And it, it became um, difficult to say, you know, well, I, I could have done both, I guess, but I didn't, I didn't do both. But that was the sort of tie. The family tie holds you to the United States. The family tie is what's here. And no matter, she knew that if she went back, her children were Americans. We were, we were not going back anywhere. Um, and at the same time, that tie of that family and, and her love for her children, there's also the tie to um, Ireland and the place where she was born. And that's why I opened the book the way I do, with a hanagram burning down. Because that, it's something I never, ever knew. Um, a house where your grandparents were born, your great-grandparents were born, your parents were born, you were born, and I just found out the other day that um, I think everybody except Gerard, were you born there? No. No, Gerard's the first one not born in a Hanagram. It's a new, a new island. So even then, the next generation would be born there. And we moved every five years. So this kind of a tie to a place, this kind of deep emotional tie to a place, is something I never knew. And I never would have known, except my mother had been going back to, back to Ireland. One of the reasons I don't remember your hanagram is because I admire you as a scholar, Richard, for being able to do it, uh, to write a, story, a history of this nature. Um, and I think part, part of the reason you could do it is, I, I've never asked you about this, is because you were an outsider as an American, you know, that you had that distance and you had that um, word constrained by the consciousness of the implications locally that I think an Irish historian would have? Um, yes, that is that is true. Um, I think either side, well, because my own identity is mixed. What I have is, a, is a, a deep interest, loyalty, and affection for both sides of the family. But what even um, shocked me as I wrote the book is my professional loyalty was as strong as it was. Um, then in fact, my identity as a historian, that's, that's what I had to do. And that's why I had to keep going back to my mother and tell her, in the end, this will be nothing at all. You can destroy this. But there, and, it, and that is probably my final act of cruelty as I think about it, because I had to have her complicit in it. Uh, she had to be complicit in what we did. Because otherwise, um, I couldn't go against her, and I would have at that point, I think, really would have destroyed it. So my loyalty is not, my distance is not total. Mm -hmm. If my mother wouldn't come with me, I was not going to go there. Um, it would have seemed just simply an act of gratuitous cruelty rather than an attempt to really explore her own, her own memories. And by, by the end, she was partially on board. You wrote it 20 years ago, Richard. Um, you know, how do you look back? I mean, how have your opinions of writing it or how you view the book changed? And I mean, I know your mom wasn't well for a lot of the last period of her life, but you know, she was well enough for a good few years after you had written it. I mean, how, I mean, and when she passed in 2014, did was this book and this project a big part of how you looked back on your time with her or, you know? This book is, is central to my relationship with my mother. It's like, I mean, like any family, my mother was my mother during the 1960s. Um, and my mother had four sons and a daughter whose political beliefs were not those of my mother. Um, so there were the tense times of the 60s and 70s. And then, like in any family, um, the grandchild knits things back together. And that's one of the things that happened. But the other thing that happened is that as my mother and I got closer, um, I, it wasn't just I enjoyed seeing her as family. I just really liked it. Um, and that this book became a collaboration. And I began to realize I was learning an awful lot from her. And at a certain point, she realized she was learning something from doing this book, too, about how she, she saw it. So by the end, she was, ends up being very proud of it. And when I go back and we re reread it, um, I'm sort of astonished by it. I'm sort of astonished by the fact that I could see it through, knowing 
what happened. I'm sort of astonished by even now knowing the outcome of how many people became deeply angry at me, angry at my mother, that I still would have done it. And when I look at the things I would have changed, they're writerly things, which there's a kind of repetition I built into the book on purpose. I'm not so sure that that was a repetition I always needed in the book. Um, but those are really minor things for what for what's there. And so my feeling about the book um, is that I'm proud of it because she's proud of it. And the hard thing is, I mean, some people know this, but my mother had been married to you for 10 years. And the hardest thing is, she is a woman who is defined by two things. She's defined by relationships. She's defined by the people she knits together. Um, and one of the things, I mean, throughout the family, my mother knit us and Ireland together. Um, and my mother, when Bobby, my Jewish grandmother, died, is my mother who went back to take care of her as she died. My mother was the one who always made sure that these kinds of things don't vanish and that it was um, emphasized that you know she would come back and haunt us if we let these kinds of things vanish, and they, and they, and, and they don't. But the hard thing for her is you can't maintain relationships with dementia. Uh, I came to see her all the time, and one of the most gratifying things is is that her death was not an easy death, and she lost consciousness but still lived for four days. And I came in just after she lost consciousness. And she roused herself, and she looked at me and smiled and said, Oh, Dick. And then she lost consciousness again. And nobody calls me Dick except my mother in the, from childhood. So there was that recognition was still there. So somehow the relationships go on. And the other part is that she was a woman who told stories. And the, the, she lost the stories. The stories were just, were just gone. Um, well, actually, I should back off. She would tell me stories, but some of the stories, there were times when, before she was totally demented, I began to wonder if she was really demented at all. Because um, <laughs> these were stories that I'd come in and she's, you know, I said, Mom, I have to go, I have to, go to work, so I, I, I have to leave. And she'd say, and what work do you do? And I'd say, you know what work I do. And she'd say, yeah, I know what work you do. You're the guy who, in a used car lot, goes out and cleans out all the old used cars and washes them before they sell them. I said, you got me, Mom. <laughs> so there were, there were still stories that were coming out, but they're not the kind of stories she had told before. Richard, can I, uh, one of the really rich um, parts of an oral history when we were collecting them here for the Archives of Irish America is the narrative around the American-born child's first visit to Ireland. Can you share with us your memories of your first time going to Ireland? It was hard because there were people in this room who were there when I showed up, but they're small, so I can argue that they don't really remember. Um, I went back, and it was, I mean, it was, it was this foreign, what, I, what my mother told me, she said, you, you'll go to Dublin, and then you'll go to a Hanover. My mother was not real clear how I got from Dublin to a Hanover. So I was there with, there's now my ex-wife, we were just married at the time, and um, I got on a bus in Dublin, and he said, where are you going? And I said, I'm going to a Hanover, it's near Bally Longford. He said, no way, where are you going? I said, I'm going to Gerard Welsh's house. And he said, why don't you tell him? So, <laughs> so in Dublin, we stopped in the middle of a farmhouse. So they let us out. That's, that's, that's where we were. And, and I, I went in there. And it was, um, you know, it's, it's my Aunt Josie, who's Gerard's mother, um, greets us with a thousand welcomes. And it, it took us three days to get out of the parlor. It was, <laughs> it was sort of hard because the family would eat in the kitchen. And then we'd eat in the parlor. So it was a hard time to actually admit that we were part of the part of the family and we ate in the parlor or part of the kitchen. But once we're back in the kitchen, it's there's a, a kind of American sensibility that's going to be different from an Irish sensibility, which the two are closer now. But I remember my ex-wife Jackie, there were there were cats and dogs on the farm, but they're working cats and dogs. And the door was open and we're eating at a table. And um, Jackie sees a dog at the doorway and does American dog stuff. So she takes a bit of food and puts it down there. 
And I saw her do it, and I looked at Gerard, and I looked at Josie. I don't think I've ever seen people more astonished in my whole life <laughs> than they were. So there's, it's real clear that this sounds really basic things. There were certain rules that were going to be established. But most of the time, um, it, it was a world that was just astonishing. It was a world that at the time, there still wasn't a car. Well, there was a car. There was somebody, I can't remember his name, but he, they called him the car. Um, so that was the car in the village. Otherwise, it was all still asses and carts, ponies and carts. And um, it was, I met my Uncle Johnny, who is um, still one of the most extraordinary people I've ever met. Um, he was illiterate. Um, and he was probably the, the funniest and one of the smartest people I've ever met. And I was sitting there at, at uh, breakfast. We got up late for dinner, so I was sitting there as probably eight or nine o'clock, which every other farmer in the townlands around there had been to the, de the um, creamery and back. And I hear this horse running down the streets out outside. And then somebody yells, hi-ho, and then dashes on past. And I, Josie was sitting there and said, who's that? She said, that'd be your Uncle Johnny. Um, <laughs> and Johnny came in, and it was just this extraordinary performance. I learned later he did this. It wasn't just that we were there. He did this every morning. This is part of the general routine. So um, it, it, I had a wonderful time there. And I also, when we were leaving, because we were going from there to France, I remember sitting with um, my Uncle Gerard at the table. And he, he asked, well, where are you going from here? And I said, oh, we're going to go to France. He listened for a minute. He said, why? <laughs> <laughs> so the whole idea that anything would be, go beyond this. That's a very scary <laughs> Richard, you know, you you went from, I'm, I'm correct in thinking that you go from writing Remembering and Hannah Brand, which I can only imagine, you know, was so emotionally taxing in ways and and a journey, um, to then your railroad book, is that right? That's the next one in the chronology? Oh, now this is going to be embarrassing. I think it is, it's 1990. 19, 19, did, did, did I do Organic Machine? I think no, that was before, that was 96. Oh, see how unreliable it was. <laughs> so, but, I mean, do you, uh, so, did writing uh, um, and researching Remember Hannah Grant, did it change you fundamentally as a historian in terms of how you research and treat I suppose for me, the most provocative thing from remembering Hannah Brown is the point you make about how how we treat our sources, right? Yeah, it, of all the books I've ever written, it had the most influence on me, the how I act as a historian. But it's also that I'm, um, as a historian, I'm sort of short attention span theater, even though I wrote a really, some really <laughs> big books, because I never do the same topic twice. I, I've done it and I move on to something else. Life's too short to keep doing the same thing over and over again. So there's a lot I learned about being a historian and it does show up. The place it shows up in railroading is I have a series of vignettes. I just take characters and throw them into the middle of the story. And I write what amounts to um, a version of taking somebody's oral account and my treating it as a historian. And those are little bits of what my mother taught me thrown into other other books. So it really did, it really did influence me. Um, and how you treat, like do you look at the people you're studying, like do you fundamentally look at them in a different way um, than you did, you know, prior to writing Remembering Hannah Brown? I, I do. Um, you know, there, there's a way in which they're not my relatives and they're not going to get the same sort of respect as my relatives, but having had to treat my relatives in a certain way, that becomes a standard for after I treat anybody else's relatives. Um, so they can be cruel, but there's a kind of fairness that I try to bring into it. And a kind of empathy. I mean, one of the things that my mother had was she was one of the most empathetic people I ever knew. And it's a, it should be part of a historian's tool. It has to be something where you can't, even if I'm going to criticize somebody, I have to at least try to understand why it is and how it is they did what they did. Um, and that comes out of, out of writing a handbag. But this one, it was because particularly, since I'm often writing about people I love, um, and I don't claim to love all historical characters, but there's a kind of respect that has to be granted. And 
that comes from a handograph too. And you know, from your, your other research, um, a lot of it at least prior, you may not have just because of chronology have been able to actually do interviews, right? In this instance, not only were you able to do inter interviews, it would add it to the richness of, of, but that source was a living, breathing, responding person. Not only that, it was your mother. It's my mother and my other relatives. And one of the things I've found since the book was published, I knew it at the time, but I didn't know how much. I'm, you know, I, I was no fool. I knew they weren't telling me everything. <laughs> and I knew I could get stuff out of them by showing them what I had, but I was never sure until after the book was published um, what it was they hadn't told me. And so there are two stories that came out afterwards that they managed to conceal, which would have been in the book, and they, I don't think they would have changed the book, but they, they're pretty central. So my grandfather goes back to Ireland. He goes back in 1947. I had just been born, and so I apparently saw my grandfather, but I was an infant. So he came by, we were in New York City at the time in Flushing. My grandfather came by and he's going back to Ireland. Um, he sees the baby, he leaves some money, and he goes back. And that's in the book is that that's his American life is over. He's going back to Ireland, he's redeemed the farms, and his Irish life will begin, but he's an Irish countryman, that's all he ever wanted to be. Um, but my uncle Pat O'Hara, who told me much of the stuff about that, later on after the book was published, I'm talking to Pat, and he, and he, bring, he himself brings it up. Um, and says, on that last trip, the last thing he said to me before he left Chicago on his way to New York and then to go back to Ireland, he, he talked about my grandmother. Um, he said, if she doesn't treat me any better this time than she did last time, I'll see you in two weeks. <laughs> so, so for the Irish countrymen going home, it's not quite <laughs> the same, the same kind, of, kind of effect. And the other thing I found out, which is um, my Aunt Sheila didn't tell me. My Aunt Sheila is, is um, now in her 90s and has, has sharp memories. <laughs> Probably knows, not probably, she knows far more about the family. She probably knows far more about me than I know about her. Um, but there's a story that she didn't tell, and that was that my grandfather, which I could never quite figure out, he's sending money back to Ireland all the time to pay the rates. How come there always, there's no money in Ireland? And it turns out, and I should say this, preface this by saying that, um, I play the horses, and I, I myself um, am a part owner in a racehorse, a very small part. <laughs> but my, the money that went back to Ireland, it turns out my grandmother was taking a portion of it and betting it on the horse races in Ireland, and she was not very good. <laughs> so when he went back in 1929, it turned out that part of the money he had sent back had been gambled away. And that's because I couldn't figure out, well, why did he go back and then come back again so quickly and start bringing over children? And so that becomes part of the story, too. So that's not in the book, only because I didn't, I didn't know it. But that's where these lives are incredibly tangled. And for them, again, that's the kind of story which threatens respectability, not for me, but that's, but that's it. But now those, those stories will be, will be told. I mean, and she was smart enough to know I'm not going to write another book about a handgram. So. <laughs> um, can I ask you, Richard, sorry to kind of go back to, um, you to have talked about um, how on both sides there's this kind of sense of persecution um, on the Irish and the Jewish side. Would you just talk a little bit about that in terms of how it played out in your in what you observed of your family history? Well, um, particularly for my mother, um, and there's, there's something I think particularly Irish about this, and it, and, it, and it actually took some fellow historians to point out to me as I was drafting the book that I was beginning to play into it themselves, is that my mother was most comfortable um, when challenged and just going into straight resistance. I mean, she was good at relationships, but if you challenged my mother, there would be a way where you could hurt her, you could strike at her, but she was never, ever going to break. 
you were not, the only time I remember seeing my mother in tears was when her mother died. And there was a sense that um, her role, that the world was against her, she would often tell me that. Um, and not just against her, but against people like her. And that the duty was to resist. She just never, ever gave in. And the odd thing is she got that in her sons, too, but often they were resisting her sometimes. <laughs> she was just attended. But there was this sense of persecution is always met with, met, met with resistance. And you, you, can, you can kill me, but I've never been a break. And that's, there's a real Irish part of it, that where much of the stories in Ireland end up, I mean, as a kid, I, 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 you know, I listened to Irish music, and um, the music starts, you know, it's, it's going to be all about, you listen to the songs, and the Irish always lose. <laughs> every, every time they go, the Irish always lose. Um, and it's the sense of victims, and it's that the English always kill them. As I did the story, I realized it's not just the English, there are all kinds of other people involved, but it gets boiled down to the, to the English. And my mother had that. I mean, one of the things, the lasting prejudices she had to the end of her life was against English. Um, it just it was never, ever going to go. Which becomes hard because part of the family migrates to England too, and so your relatives, but it's, it becomes very, very complicated. So that kind of resistance was there. And on the Jewish side, of course, I, I grew up in the shadow of, of the Holocaust. Mm -hmm. um, and it was the same kind of sense that um, you are, that the world is going to attack you really um, going to be very foolish unless you recognize that. And I, and I realize the way I write history is I'm always, there's no accident that the first history I started writing was Native American history. And there is no accident that so many of the non-Indian historians who've written Native American history tend to be Irish or Jewish. Indians tend to become a people that Irish and Jewish historians can identify with. Um, so there's that, I think, begins to influence it, too. But there, there's this also this, the, the sense that um, you can get along, but you're never really going to be one of them. I mean, there doesn't matter who them was. It. So already I'm showing you the contradictions of growing up in this kind of background, because I always considered myself only an American, but I always also considered myself always an outsider, never and never fully trusting in it. And then the I, idea that and, and, and if my mother were here, I'd ask her, though she wouldn't, she wouldn't tell me, that um, how in the world she could raise children who the basic lesson from both sides of the family was distrust of authority. And they end up getting people like me and my brothers and sister and be surprised by it. I, I just, <laughs> <laughs> um, would we open it up to, does anyone in the audience have any questions or comments? Joe? Sure. I'll give you a mic. I suspect that uh, most of the people in the room uh, who are immigrants to this New York City, uh, for me, the, in the book, the, the scene I most remember is the, the scene of your mother arriving in New York. Uh, it's just, it's, it's cinematographic. Could you, could you tell that to me? Sure. Um, and it's the one thing is you'll notice on that, that's a story I do not deconstruct. Uh, because my mother tells it in this incredible detail. The only part I deconstruct is the scene starts with her going to Ellis Island, and I was never able to convince my mother that she could not have come into Ellis Island because the only people going to Ellis Island were being deported from America, not coming to America. But after that, she picks up, it's a world in which she is an Irish peasant girl. She's a servant girl. She'd been a, literally a servant for four years. She's 16 years old. And she comes in and um, a cousin meets her because now she enters the string of what is chain migration. Um, that's the migration that brought me here. It's chain migration. And a cousin meets her and the cousin had become a buyer for um, a New York department store. And actually when he was a buyer who traveled to Asia. So this is a world where they, this is the same family, but this is a, a, just a world apart. So he meets her, and also he comes in, and my cousin's wife was both taller than he was, and was a beautiful woman. It was a woman who, um, for my mother, she just, 
I would say it's what you saw in movies, but you've never seen a movie, so it couldn't have been that. Um, so there's this kind of glamour, and they take her to a New York apartment building, and she goes through New York. She, she's, from, you know, she's from a small village in Western Island, the Stoll's the biggest place she's ever seen, and she's, you know, she's barely seen a car, and now there are cars and trains, there's all this stuff everywhere, and she's just astonished by it. So as she comes in, they take her to the apartment, and um, they put her to bed, she's exhausted, and they say they have to go to work in the morning. And so when she gets up, um, they tell her there's milk and cereal. She has no idea what cereal is. Um, <laughs> But there's a box and there's a set of cornflakes in it, and she has no idea that there'd be milk in the refrigerator. She doesn't know how to open the refrigerator. <laughs> so she just eats the, the um, cereal by hand, and then she, while she's eating the cereal, um, the door opens. And the door opens, and a maid comes in. And the maid is African American. She's black. And my mother had never seen a black person before. And so, she says to my mother, hello. My mother doesn't say anything. My mother just sits there and stares. She doesn't know what to do. And she tells me later on, she cleans the house, she cleans the sink. And she said, if she had cleaned me, I wouldn't have moved. Um, <laughs> so this, the whole world is so astonishing to her. And then they come back and put her on the train to send her off to Chicago. And it's at this point, it's a long train ride to Chicago, but she doesn't know how to use a flush toilet. So she doesn't go to the bathroom for the whole trip to Chicago. They, they've given her money to go to a dining car, but she has no idea what a dining car is or where the dining car is. So it's this long trip all the way over. And, it's, and it's, that's where she points out. And the, story, the effect of the story, which is my mother's storytelling, but this part is true, is to set up, this is what Greenhorn means. This is what it means when you come to the country. She knows nothing. Um, and that sets the stage for her to turn herself into what she always calls an American girl, um, which is the opposite of a, of a green horn. And that becomes her ambition in the whole time she's in Chicago, and she succeeds. And that really, Richard, you make the point that really, for your mother, when she meets her father, his, his identity as Jewish is pretty meaningless to yeah. her, right? Mm -hmm. It is, because for her, it's, um, it's she knew she, he wasn't Catholic, and that was going to be trouble. Um, <laughs> but Jewish didn't mean anything. What really meant a lot to her was that here was a soldier who was clearly American, who thought of her as an American girl. He recognized the Irish lilt in her voice, but at the same time for him, this is a recognition. This is what life will be like. And she did, my mother doesn't realize at the time, she knows the war is changing everything, but she has no idea how much the war has changed things. Because my father is the child of immigrants, and my grandfather had gone to prison, but my father graduated from Harvard. Um, my mother um, got through maybe the third grade at, at Bally Longford. So this is, these are worlds apart. It's not just Catholic and Jewish, but this gap in education. These, they never would have met, and they certainly never would have gotten married. And only in doing this book, because my mother, in, in writing the book, we get to, they meet in um, New Orleans, which is this wonderful story. Mm -hmm. And then my father goes overseas a couple of years later, um, and she goes to live with Bubby, my, my grandparents in Boston, where she's known as, as um, Jenny Shiksa. And, <laughs> and there's a couple of years in between, so mom. <laughs> so, so, okay, you met, and then now you're married, and he goes overseas, and what happens in between? <coughs> and she wouldn't talk about that, because what happens in between is how they came to be married. And how they came to be married is they barely knew each other. Um, they corresponded. He invited her to come out. I think that was the second time they met, and he proposed marriage, and then they get married. So these are these are strangers getting married. Um, and the thing I realized at the time, this went on because through the beginning of the marriage, they were deeply in love, and they were and it was really a, a wonderful marriage. In the end, it, it wasn't so wonderful. But those years were in fact that we get rejected by both families. And she has to tell her children, who she was always cautioning about how to behave, okay, so let me get me straight. You meet this guy in New Orleans, you fly out, to, you see him a second time, and then you're married. 
Um, that's how it goes. That's essentially how it goes. So she didn't want to tell those yeah. kinds of stories. But that's, that's what I had to press out of her. But that's where the gaps in stories are. And it's only by being a historian. I had no idea what would be in there, but I didn't know that the reader was also going to wonder, wait a minute, two years have passed, and nothing, nothing has gone on here. Thank you so much. Um, I read the book and assigned it to many different classes, so I've read it and reread it many times. More than I have. <laughs> Absolutely more than you have. Yes, the students <laughs> love it. Um, my question is about stories, and this also has to do with the, the way that I discuss the book with students, um, graduate and undergraduate. You're listening to your mother's stories and you're checking it against the archives, but the trouble is the archives are, are also stories. Yeah. So, um, and this is something I puzzle out with my students, so court testimony is the way someone tells a story because they're telling the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Um, even letters, the way people craft their lives in letters are stories. And you know, we could go on, the census categories are stories in a way, or a photograph can be a story the way it's composed. So, um, I have no interest in a kind of postmodern view of history in which nothing is true and everything is true, not at all. I have an interest in telling the truest possible stories. But what, what was it like, and how do you think now about that idea of your mother's stories being checked against the archives, which themselves are stories? Yeah. These are perfectly right. I mean, what it is is going to be stories versus a different kind of story. And the different kind of story is that there's a difference between a historical story that ends up being written down and memorialized. It is dead at that moment. Mm -hmm. It is not going to change any further. When I go back and get those things, they are what they were in 1932. My mother will change everything. So what I do when I talk about it is one of the wonderful things I found is when I, when I was back in Ireland, I'll give you an example of two sources. Um, one of which was in the attempt to create an Irish nation in the 1930s, they decided the real Ireland was rural Ireland. So they went back and they started gathering stories largely in schools, and it turns out when I was back there, all these people in Kerry, I knew some of them, but I, this is when they were children and they're telling stories that have been told by their um, parents. So what I get is a set of stories as they were being told in Ireland in the 1930s, which turned out to be very different than the kinds of stories my mother told, and, it, and I would, couldn't recover them in modern Ireland, they were no longer told, but I think very few people remember them. So those stories could work as an anchor to recreate what was going on. They make no pretense because these are, you know, these are stories about fairies. These are stories about horses up a tree. So I'm not saying, no, this is literally, there was a horse up a tree. There was, but these are stories that tell you how people think. And that's going to be different than my mother remembering back that we were, we were all poor, but we were all happy. So that's, these, these are different kinds of stories. But the other one was, in going to Trinity College, um, Trinity College was the landlord for the lands that um, came into being in the Hanagram. And what I could find there was I could find a whole set of things. Yeah, there's stories, but there's stories that are going to be the amount of rent that's paid, the amount of rent that's going to be in arrears, the amount of um, descriptions of the tenants, as I still remember, a bad lot is what, what was the common, was the common thing. Um, and so this, these are different a story is being told there, but it's a story that was recorded in the 19th century, early 20th century, and cannot be changed. And those stories are not like memories. Those memories, my mother would change them all the time. And would try to get me to change them. I mean, that's as I say, it wouldn't, it wouldn't do it. So that's, that's the distinction that I make. Because nothing, I mean, we're all, where it starts. We know that there's nothing hard and fast. This is somebody's version of what had happened. But some versions, and I still have the historian's prejudice, the closer to the time that it occurred, the more likely it is that you're going to get accurate details. And the further away it is from the time that it occurred, the less likely that you're going to get accurate details. Uh, Professor, good evening. Um, a couple of years ago, I had the pleasure of working on a program with Dr. Daniel Schechter at Harvard, who's done a great deal of research on the science of memory. Mm -hmm. In fact, uh, one of his books that came out right around the time of yours was Searching for Memory, uh, the Brain, the Mind, and the Past. And one of the points that he's made is that all human memory is subject to change, and every time
are the reform members, uh, we are putting additional gloss on it in some fashion of which we are not even aware. Um, as a semi-retired trial lawyer, I know that many times uh, you'll have someone who's absolutely sure of their recollection and it turns out that they're not. And the question is how to portray them as recalling what they actually believe rather than trying to inject falsehood intentionally. Uh, my question to you is uh, whether you ever formed a conclusion in writing your book uh, as to whether um, any differences between your mother's recall and what you found independently uh, were the subject of how it really works or something <coughs> intentional. Uh, I think earlier this evening you alluded to an effort to make something intentional. But I have a feeling that when you were writing the book, the distinction might have been a little more subtle than that. Well, as it turns out, most of the stuff I concentrate on the book is intentional. I'll tell you why I know this. Because one of the things is my mother would take a series of tropes. There'd be a series of ways in which you remember what it is to be an immigrant. The Ellis Island one is a good one. Um, because the story of being an immigrant to the United States is my mother learned very quickly has to include Ellis Island. So my mother includes Ellis Island. There's another instance in the, in the book where she remembers seeing the, the, book, the, the ship she was on. Is, it's a terrible North Atlantic crossing when she's writing. It's part of the stuff that it really was. And she comes into Boston, and, that's, um, and it has a blanking on the name of the ship she was on. But, the uh, Laconia. Laconia feared lost the ride safely. And so I searched through all Boston newspaper headlines. I could not find it. It doesn't mean that there wasn't a headline there, but I doubt if there was because there were all the telegraphic supports that were always in contact with the ship. They knew the ship had not been lost. But the purpose of that headline is it creates a link between her and my father who lived in Boston. It's my father also, by the end, he'd come to believe that, in fact, he saw that headline, too. So what the, what the point of the concept of the story is it links them together before they're actually going to be linked later on. And much of my mother's storytelling is going to be like that. In the same way, when she tells me to switch the cousins, she has a point in doing that. So along with the fallibility of, of memory, which I'm not talking about at all, I mean, the courts and all the recall things get added, she is a storyteller. She's not just remembering facts which somebody else is forcing her to recall she would never recall on her own. She is recalling things that will make sense and to communicate it to others. And so for her, it's the story that really matters. And after she tells these stories a lot, she never thinks of herself as lying. She herself comes to believe them because, and they are true in the sense that they do explain who she is at a certain, at a certain point. So I think both of these things can be true. There's going to be a kind of fallibility because I've been an expert witness and I've been on witness stands and it's 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 daunting to undo it. I've also been the expert witness who goes after other witnesses in, in terms of remembering. And I know all of that, but this I think is something different because that's why that's why the in the end I called the book the subtitle A History of Stories, because that's what it really is about. Well, um, folks, we've, I think we've, we've worked you enough today, Richard, <laughs> this afternoon and this evening, and um, thank you. And um, I thought that it would be fitting um, before we wrap up to, if I can, if the technology will bear with me, to hear Sarah's voice. Um, I just, I pulled this clip, um, and it's actually, it, it's really, it, it really goes to the core of like you as a historian um, asking her questions and doing what we do and hopefully it would, the technology will cooperate and we can hear the voice of, um, of Sarah here in the room, let me just see. that you talked about um, starting with well why was that the first night that you came to America now you reached America the night you spent in was this cell I can't remember which town it was I know 
know, car. But I remember you showed me a place in the cell where you went weaving the cell and then you went to court. And was it rage or something that, that was associated with your coming? It was some place when we went to. To the stall bridge where the train was. Right, that's, that's what it was. Right. And did you take the train to court? Well, the, I went on the pony and track. Um, the tracks, you know, we used to pull the pony. And my Tim, my cousin, got on the, the, the track. And I got in the track, and my mom followed me down crying at the turn of the road. Crying. And so was Mary crying. And uh, I remember looking back and then standing there with their hands up in the air, and a pony and trap cut me through the store. And that's where the train was. And I uh, got on the train, and I had just one little satchel with me. And I was so afraid, so afraid I'd never been on the valley. Only once, and that's when I went to Dublin to get my passport. But that was in a car. But it's the first time I'm sitting on the train. And I sat on this train and came to court and took all day long, all day long on the So that's Sarah, and I'd like to um, call on my colleague, Mary Casey. <coughs> to present Richard, I'm sorry, it's just emotional hearing her voice um, when you read of her so much and, and Richard, thank you so much for your generosity and all that you've done with uh, giving us a copy of the recordings and um, uh, in what uh, Remembering a Hanagan does I think is a provocative piece of history um, and uh, lovely memorialization of your mother's journey and thank you so much for coming here, I know you weren't feeling well it's wonderful. This was the first invitation we extended as part of our Jewish-Irish programming as part of our 25th anniversary. It is really, really stimulating for us to have you physically in the room after reading you for so long. And um, join us downstairs for a glass of wine and Richard will join us. And thank you for coming here this evening. Thank you so much.